Welcome to a special episode of Breakthrough Dialogues, the podcast for pragmatists and problem solvers brought to you by the Breakthrough Institute. I'm Alex Trembath, your host and deputy director at Breakthrough. For this episode, we're featuring the audio of a recent webinar Breakthrough hosted titled, We Made Solar and Wind Cheap, Now What? This was a conversation we hosted in June 2020 on the role that government deployment subsidies have played in making renewable energy technologies cheap over the years and what to do with those subsidies as clean energy technologies become more and more economically competitive. Joining the webinar were Leah Stokes from UC Santa Barbara, Varun Sivaram from Columbia Center for Global Energy Policy, myself, and our moderator Zoya Tierstein from Grist. Within a healthy agreement about the value of technology policy in addressing climate change, I think you'll hear some healthy disagreement about the role of deployment subsidies and the readiness of existing technologies to drive towards deep decarbonization. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this panel today and for making time on a Friday to talk about tax credits. Um, we're all really excited to, to get into it today. Um, as many of you know, Renewables have made great strides in recent years. Solar has become cheaper, so has wind. We've expanded into new territory that some experts thought was still a long way off and is actually here a lot sooner. Offshore wind capacity, new kinds of nuclear, different kinds of solar with mirrors, um, electric trucks, I could go on. Um, but we're gonna talk about some of those things today. Um, but first I wanna introduce our panelists. Um, and I want to remind everyone that we are taking questions at the end of the panel. Um, I'm going to ask a few first, but you can just drop them in the Q&A chat right here down below, um, and I'll be sure to get to them in a bit. Okay, great. Um, so first up, we have Leah Stokes. Leah is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science. I'm going to read off a, off a sheet here because it's actually, you guys have a lot of bona fides. Uh, Department of Political Science at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She works on energy, climate, and environmental politics, and her research has been published in a slew of well-regarded journals. I was gonna list them, but there's actually too many, so uh, I'll just leave it there. Um, and she has written pieces for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and has appeared numerous times in uh, grist.org, which is where I work. Um, Varun Savaram is a physicist, and most recently was chief technology officer for Renew Power, India's largest renewable energy company. Wow and was previously the director of the Energy and Climate Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. Time Magazine named him to its Time 100 Next Most Influential People in the World. And he's also the author of a well-known book, Taming the Sun, Innovations to Harness Solar Energy and Power the Planet. Whew. Okay. Alex Trembath is deputy director at the Breakthrough Institute, our generous host. Um, and he is the lead or co-author of several breakthrough publications, including a new report that we're gonna talk about today. And his writing has been published by Slate, the Boston Globe, the San Francisco Chronicle, and other very distinguished places. I've also interviewed him for Grist. Um, so with that, we're gonna launch right into our questions. And again, just a reminder to anyone new who just jumped in, um, we are taking questions from the audience at the end of this. So if you have any questions, just drop them in the Q&A box right here in the Zoom call. Okay, great. So uh, in my reporting on renewables during the coronavirus, which is, as you all know, a massive issue right now, it's ongoing, um, I've, I've heard mixed reports. So some reports say the pandemic has actually helped renewables surpass coal. Other reports say um, the, the industry has hemorrhaged 600,000 jobs since March. And I'm wondering, what is the net impact of, of the pandemic on renewables? Are we in a different place now than we were in February? Um, and I want to open that up to Varun first, and then we can take it from there. All right. Um, well, thanks. Thanks, Zoya, for the uh, very kind introduction. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks to the Breakthrough Institute for having me. And congratulations uh, to Alex uh, and to Lauren on your terrific report. I just also want to say I'm a huge fan of Leah. I have read her book. I'm a big fan of her research. Very thrilled to be here and uh, to be doing this. Um, look, none of us thought we would be looking at the renewable energy the way we are right now when we were back in February. Um, it's been a huge change. And so, uh, as I'm sure many of you have seen, energy markets have been upended as a result. Um, oil markets took it on the nose 
but it's not just oil. Coal is not doing very well. Remarkably, renewable energy has turned out to be fairly resilient around the world, but that's not to say that there's no danger to the renewable energy industry. COVID's hit, you know, it's, a, it's an equal opportunity economic destroyer. Uh, and so renewable energy, I think in, the, in this country and in the country it just came from, in India, uh, it's, it's, it's a dicey moment right now. In India, for example, uh, renewable energy has maintained fairly solid levels, but if the COVID crisis continues much longer and we continue to see you know, protracted lockdowns or a second wave, maybe tough to construct new renewable energy pro uh, projects. So for the sake of the clean energy transition going forward, um, it's gonna be super important uh, to make sure that right now we continue to invest in clean energy and that the energy transition continues. It's as much an opportunity as a risk, and I'm sure we're going to get into that. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Alex about the report and from Leah about her thoughts. Yeah, Leah, do you want to comment on that at all, on where, how, where we've been and, and what has changed? Sure, yeah. So thanks so much for having me, and thanks so much to the 130-plus uh, of you who have joined us today. We're all really excited to talk with you. Um, I am pretty uh, negative about the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, unfortunately, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has been really devastating for the renewable energy industry. As Varun mentioned, the last job reports that I've seen came from early last month, and so it's probably worse now. But we were talking about more than 600,000 jobs in the United States alone being lost in the renewable energy sector. And this is coming at a time when uh, the renewable energy industry really needs to be ramping up, not going through another um, bust cycle, not by any fault of its own, but um, just by the economic situation. And Congress had an opportunity through the CARES Act and through other legislation that it's passed and maybe through future legislation to address this problem. And unfortunately, a lot of the money uh, that has been spent under that policy is going to fossil fuel companies. We don't even know the full extent. I think yesterday there was a Trump administration official who said that they weren't going to tell us. I can't remember who it was off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, that's really not transparent or clear. And we're talking about, um, you know, billions of dollars being spent on propping up a dying fossil fuel industry. So we are very much Mnuchin. Yes, thank you, Jack. Exactly. That's what I thought it was, but I do want to get it wrong. Um, you know, we are spending so much money propping up an economically in crisis industry and really wasting money because that money won't come back. So this is very disturbing. If you've read my book, uh, you've seen uh, short circuiting policy that you've seen that the industry has gone through these boom and bust cycles before. And uh, it's not without cost. In the early 80s, uh, there were tax credits in place for renewable energy. That's actually how California became a leader globally in wind and solar and geothermal. And by what, the Reagan administration, all those tax credits went away and you saw massive bankruptcies in the industry by the early 1990s. Uh, we can't go through that again right now. There's absolutely no time left in the calendar to have that happen. And so I'm really worried about the industry and I'm really disturbed that both Democrats and Republicans aren't willing to do basic things like extend tax credits, which I know we'll talk a bunch about today. So yeah, it's dark days uh, for the renewable energy industry. That's a perfect segue into talking about what, what one of the main things we're here to talk about today, which is the new report. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Alex right now to just discuss that a little bit um, and to intro that so we can so we can learn a bit about it. Thanks, Zoya. Folks can hear me. Uh, thanks so much, Zoya. Uh, thanks, Varun and Leah, for being here. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, I appreciate that Leah was talking about the risks of these boom and bust cycles that we've seen. Uh, in renewable energy over the past 10, 20, 30 years. The very first report that I worked on at Breakthrough in 2011, 2012 was a report called Beyond Boom and Bust, putting clean tech on a path to subsidy independence, uh, which this report that we released this week is a bit of a sequel to. I'm sure we'll dig into the report uh, in, the, in the conversation, in the q and I, I wanted to spend a couple minutes just giving some history and some context um, behind, uh, behind our thinking um, uh, historically and behind where we think renewable energy and electric power decarbonization are going. Um, so in the, in the truly ancient history of 2008, Breakthrough released uh, one of our first papers. It was titled Fast, Clean and Cheap in the Harvard Law and Policy Review. 
And in that paper, we made a pretty strong case, I think, for uh, aggressive federal investment in clean energy research, development, demonstration, and deployment. The rallying cry of breakthrough at the time of that paper, of breakthrough today, was and is make clean energy cheap. This was one of the one of the first big cases for buying down the cost of clean energy technologies when most clean energy technologies, wind, especially solar, were much more expensive than they are today. In the intervening decade, there's been this debate that is uh, sort of often facetiously called the innovation versus deployment debate. And to paint with a broad brush, on the one side, you've got environmental economists uh, who say that specific supports and subsidies for specific technologies that are above cost are an inefficient and expensive way to mitigate emissions compared to, say, putting a price on carbon and activating uh, fuel switching, efficiency, conservation, uh, and as uh, really cheap and affordable emissions lowering options. And on over here, we'll also do some innovation. We'll do some R&D and we'll buy down the cost of technologies. On the other side, you've got a set of clean tech advocates, climate hawks saying, no, actually innovation is deployment. Just look at how these deployment subsidies are correlated with cost declines in solar, in wind, in batteries. And in fact, we need to be accelerating decarbonization. Uh, we need to be doubling down on, on these policies. Uh, and in our view, both of these camps are a little bit right and a little bit wrong. Um, so obviously, in our view, deployment leads to innovation. Just look at government procurement of semiconductors 50 years ago. Look at federal supports for uh, exploration of unconventional oil and gas reserves. Obviously, look at solar and wind and batteries over time. You're seeing cost declines, not just in economies of scale, but in innovations in manufacturing, fabrication, supply chains, mat materials, on and on. Um, and, and, those, and those deployment supports, that specifically the ITC uh, and the PTC, federal tax credits, have really helped drive uh, cost declines and innovation in the solar and onshore wind industries. Uh, but once market penetration starts rising, the complaints of the environmental economists do start to carry a little bit more weight. We're spending almost $7 billion a year subsidizing solar and wind projects alone, projects that are increasingly and, and many, many times rightly celebrated as being subsidy independent. Um, so, uh, so while progress has uh, continued in, uh, in solar and wind, we've also seen, I think, a growing consensus that solar and wind are not enough uh, to achieve de decarbonization in the electric power sector, let alone the whole economy. So solar and wind have gotten increasingly competitive uh, subsidy independent in many cases. And in the meantime, uh, there are a set of other technologies that are maybe less mature, but still essential that we think could benefit from the, from the types of support um, that have benefited solar and wind over the past 15, 30 years. Uh, so for a while at Breakthrough, uh, we've talked about uh, sort of shifting our position, which has always been in favor of extending federal tax credits for deployment, um, in favor of, uh, of finally sunsetting supports for solar and onshore wind. And then the pandemic hit. Uh, now, is, uh, as Leah was getting at, certainly not the time to, end, to sort of abruptly end federal support for crucial American industries. Uh, but we do think that maybe in a few years, hopefully on the wings of a robust uh, American uh, economic recovery, that we should really start talking about finally sunsetting the tax credit supports for solar and onshore wind and redirecting those federal dollars, those tax equity dollars, towards less mature technologies, advanced nuclear, enhanced geothermal, offshore wind, which is starting to get a foothold, but it's still much less, much less down the cost curve than onshore wind, um, uh, carbon removal, batteries, things like this. Um, in, the, uh, in the report, which I'm sure we'll dig into, we also make recommendations uh, around in increasing federal investment um, and federal support for siting and permitting large infrastructure, transmission, uh, generation, as well as recommendations uh, around, uh, around electricity storage. Um, as I said, we'll get into some of the details. I think you can read the full paper. Um, it's pretty short. Um, but uh, fundamentally, you know, for us, this is a conversation about what deployment policy is for uh, and, uh, and the imperative of being technologically inclusive, uh, because as, as successful as we've been in driving uh, progress in solar and winds, uh, progress that we expect to continue, uh, we, need, uh, we need a lot more technologies um, and we think we, can, we have a lot to learn from the success that we've seen so far uh, in, in other technologies and other sectors. And I'll leave it at that. Great. Leah, do you want to respond to that? And just as a side note, uh, for anyone tuning in, this session will be recorded and uh, that will be available to folks who want to take a look later.
Great. Well, I'm super um, delighted to have a chance to respond to the report. Um, you know, I would really encourage everybody on the call to take a look at it. I agree with so much that is in this report. Uh, they talk a lot on the importance of focusing on complementary technologies, things like storage, firm, um, electricity technologies. Uh, you know, these are actually things that Jesse Jenkins, who I know is a former Breakthrough Institute fellow, has written about in his academic work too. And I'm pretty convinced of these arguments. Um, I, they also talk about focusing on innovation to kind of get us to that last 10% of decarbonizing our electricity system. And on that note, I would really recommend people check out the Grid Lab report that came out two days ago um, with um, the Berkeley Goldman School. It's a report that looks at can we get to 90% clean electricity by 2035, and it's an excellent report. And there's also a companion report by um, Energy Innovation. So I think that's a great uh, and very well taken point. And I like the ideas of a technology inclusive approach for a clean electricity standard. That's where I think so much of the discussion is going and I agree with it. I like the ideas of developing renewables on public lands. And I'll just echo that I think uh, planning is gonna be a big problem and not just for transmission, which the report focuses a lot on, but for offshore wind, for onshore large scale wind projects, um, for large scale onshore solar projects. How do we get these projects planned and permitted faster if we actually want to address the problem? So there's so there's a lot of great ideas here. I think where maybe I have some disagreement and it wouldn't be a Breakthrough Institute event if we weren't arguing with each other, um, is on the pace of the change that's necessary and what that means from a financing perspective and some thoughts on politics and where we can find money to do the things we need to do. So, um, first of all, just because something is cheap doesn't mean that it necessarily happens. And this is a point that I make endlessly in my work, including in my book. Um, but the market is just not as deterministic as maybe we would hope. Uh, and you just don't have to look too far to see that. Look at what Trump has been doing with the minimum offer price rule through FERC, right? This is a way that the market is being distorted, we could say. And even in general, not internalizing the externalities of air pollution and climate change, you know, those are also market distortions in a certain sense. So just because wind and solar is cheap doesn't mean that it necessarily happens. And I think we need to continue to pay attention to the way that opponents are going to figure out ways to make their technology cheaper, even as ours becomes better on all these dimensions, according to modeling by that grid lab report or Christopher Clack's work or uh, lots of others. And then the second thing I'll say is that the pace that's necessary, which I know everybody knows, but really steeping yourself in the pace of change is something I've been doing. And I got to say, I've been working on climate change for 15 years, and the, the exercise of creating these figures that people have called the narwhal curve, which is on a grist video, actually, so you can check that out. Um, it's really been illuminating to me and my own thinking. The pace of deployment that we're talking about is really remarkably unprecedented. And, you know, especially when you take into consideration electrification of transportation and buildings, the pace gets even more punishing. So I have lots of things I've written about that scale. So from my perspective, we have to have policies in place that don't just say, okay, well, wind, is solar, wind and solar are cheap and they'll get deployed at whatever pace that will naturally do. We need things, deployment policies to make things go really fast. And you can think about the 1603 grants program under the Recovery Act as an example of that. It doesn't have to be your tax credits. Because I do take the point that tax credits have some limitations because there's oh, there's not an endless amount of tax equity that you can get. And I, J.R. Shaw has definitely influenced my thinking on this that you know maybe we do need some of that tax equity and tax credits to be going towards newer technologies, battery, let's say, batteries or other firm technologies. Um, but politics, as Jerry Taylor in a Breakthrough Institute event with me told me, politics is the art of the possible. And so as much as I take the point from sort of a theoretical, what would be the best, you know, how would we best spend tax equity and what would be the best use of tax credits, you know, we can't even seem to get tax credits extended for mature industries that have lobbying behind them, you know, SIA and AWEA, how are we going to get those tax credits extended for immature technologies that don't have political coalitions behind them in the same way? And the last thing I'll say is let's, let's take a little bit of inspiration from the defund the police um, movement that's going on right now. So much we, we get asked, you know, how are we going to pay for it? And we are always 
uh, somebody responded to a tweet for me today too, because I was tweeting about the Green New Deal and some new research that we published. You know, they said, oh, it's so expensive. Yeah, b giveaways are always easy. Well, how come we don't talk about the $20 billion that go to fossil fuel subsidies every year? And why don't we think about reallocating that towards grants? And I know everybody on this call agrees with not subsidizing fossil fuels. So I don't mean it that way, but maybe we need to expand our imagination a little bit when we think about how to find money for what we want to be doing. And we need to really be taking away money from services um, that aren't providing what we need, namely fossil fuel companies, and putting them towards um, clean technology. So personally, I feel like I can understand where this report is coming from, and I think it's very valuable. But what if we kind of expanded our thinking and thought about other ways to find money? So yeah, great report. Really recommend you check it out. And those are some of my thoughts about it. Great. Thanks, Leah. Uh, just a reminder to, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box below. There are some amazing questions in there and we're going to get to them soon. Uh, but first, I'm going to hand it over to Varun to respond to the report. Great. Thanks, Zoya. Um, I completely agree with Leah that the scale of the challenge is something that we don't contemplate often enough. And Leah's narwhal curve is the greatest like image to get in your head about uh, the sharp discontinuous non-smooth function that we need to, to accelerate deployment. Um, but I think it's precisely because of the narwhal curve that we need to care deeply about cost because this is about to get really, really expensive. So I think what I'll quickly do is, is talk about four points. I'll, I'll share my reactions to the report I wanna share some lessons from India. This surprised even me, but I think that we actually have some things we can learn uh, from India's clean energy transition for the United States. Uh, then I wanna say a little bit about what that means for this next phase of the US clean energy transition where we try and follow Leah's narwhal curve. And then let me end by responding to just a couple quick things that Leah said. So let me start number one on the report. Um, Alex, I think it's a, it's a fantastic report. I you know, agree with pretty much everything that's in it. Um, I think right now, as you correctly point out, this is not the time to sunset the ITC and PTC. Um, you know, the, the government right now has a negative real borrowing cost. We seem to be throwing money all over the place. Um, and it's critical that we keep people in their jobs. So right now, let's not shake up the industry. But I think you've been right to call for a sunset of the ITC and PTC. And, and, and I agree with that call. Um, that they should get sunsetted uh, after we make it through uh, this difficult period. Um, I also agree with the report's recommendations to invest in enabling infrastructure, transmission lines, I'd add carbon dioxide and hydrogen pipelines and storage, electric vehicle charging equipment, all enabling infrastructure to accelerate the clean energy transition. And finally, I, I agree with you, Alex, and, and, and uh, your co-author, Lauren, on on mature technologies, needing a technology inclusive approach going forward as we try and move up the, the narwhal curve. Um, let me just share a couple lessons from, from India. Um, this will surprise you to hear that the cost of, clean, uh, of solar power in India is 50% of the cost of solar power in the United States. This is at the utility scale. It shocked me when I figured this out. I moved over to India a couple years ago and I started looking at our bill of materials and our cost structure, and I compared it to the large installations I'd seen in the United States, right? And we're seeing multi-hundred megawatt installations. And in India, the, the last publicly available number that I can share came from IRENA last year for 2019. $618 per kilowatt is the installed cost of an Indian solar plant. $1,221 is the installed cost of an American solar plant. At least some of that uh, owes its provenance to a generous subsidy in the United States. Among other things, when I looked at the, the bill of materials after having been in India, I realized how much we overpay for certain parts of a solar installation in the United States. And, and there's some things that are predictable, right? Um, Labor is going to be more expensive, et cetera. Margin, margin's way higher in the United States compared with India. And you can go through every single one of the like 15 major parts of a solar installation. Um, so, so I think in India, we could learn something about getting really, really low cost clean energy. India is deploying every year proportionally more solar and wind than the United States is compared to its installed base. And there aren't explicit subsidies like the ITC and PTC. Now, it's not to say that the government doesn't do anything. In fact, the government's playing a central role. The government in India arranges these long-term power purchase agreements. And in doing so, it, it finds a counterparty to offtake the power, et cetera. Um, 
And India's got these remarkable goals, you know, arguably more ambitious than the United States, 450 gigawatts of solar and wind and other renewable energy by 2030. So I think there is something we can learn from India that if we're going to make it up this narwhal curve, we don't necessarily only need to use the existing instruments that have gotten us to where we have. Because to, to be clear, tax incentives have been remarkably useful in getting renewable energy to where they are today. I've got a paper coming out from the Bipartisan Policy Coalition uh, next week, I think, uh, that argues that the, you know, the, the ITC was critical to the first five utility scale greater than 100 megawatt installations in the United States being built uh, along with the loan guarantee program. But they may have outlived their usefulness. Um, they're distortive in, on, on various metrics. There's a great question from James Temple. I hope we get to it in the Q&A about, well, why wouldn't we keep this second or third or fourth best policy? The answer, I think, is, is because we need to care deeply about cost now that we're going to increase our deployment rate, or so I hope. Right now, the United States deploys, I think we deployed 22 gigawatts of wind and solar in 2019. I'd like to see that go up by three or four X over the next 15 years. Leah mentioned the Grid Lab report. That's about in line with what they call for. That's going to get really expensive if we depend on our existing instruments. So going forward, what's it going to take to, to scale the narwhal curve? Well, I think, and, and, and this may not be politically feasible in the next few months, but, but I still think carbon pricing is by far the most uh, efficient deployment policy. Uh, if, if we want to quickly phase off coal and quickly ramp up clean energy, uh, carbon pricing is the way to go. There are a lot of other things that we can do that, that are frankly more politically tractable. Um, wholesale market integration has proceeded in fits and starts, the Western uh, grid, for example. Uh, integrating that uh, at a market level would be a, a, a big step toward enabling clean energy to be efficiently dispatched. Uh, we want to invest in transmission. The Grid Lab report that uh, Leah mentioned uh, makes the surprising claim that a lot of new cross-country transmission is not required. It actually contradicts the other study that Leah mentioned, which is the CLAC study, which says you need a, a nationwide high voltage direct current network. Um, now, Grid Lab has not published their technical appendix. Leah, you may have seen it, but I haven't. So I, I can't say whether I, I agree with the modeling, but it is a solid, solid uh, modeling team. And finally, th there are important things in the power market related to flexibility. I think there are regulatory reforms on the, on the distribution side of the business that could enable kind of a new paradigm of distribution uh, service operators, distribution system operators to marshal flexibility on the demand side and to more efficiently use distributed energy resources. I'm a particular fan of megawatt scale solar that's distributed at the urban scale. I think it's the best of both worlds between large, large scale solar and very small decentralized rooftop solar. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about that more. Um, and finally, I think uh, uh, I do wanna make the point that you know, tax incentives going forward can play a very important role, but it's a niche role. It's that role in early scale up of an emerging technology. And Leah told us, uh, and Leah, you said this kind of in passing. You said, hey, innovation is important, but for the last 10%. Let's be very clear. The last 10% is a large underestimate of the emissions reductions that innovation will be required for. I know there's at least one person from the IEA on this call. Um, I'm not going to name him, but, but he's a you know, fantastic resource that I've learned a lot for. And, and I know the IEA has done great research on modeling the percentage of emissions that will need to come from technologies that are right now at the prototype stage, at the demonstration stage, at all stages that are not mature, where today's utility scale solar and wind are. And the large majority of those emissions reductions in order to get to net zero by 2070 will need to come from non-mature technology. So uh, it's, it's critical, uh, I think, that, that we you know, elevate innovation even more. And I'm a both and kind of guy. Look, you, I, I want to deploy, deploy right now so we get up that narwhal curve, but I also want to invest decisively in innovation. Leah made an extremely interesting point, uh, again, sort of in passing, that immature technologies don't have political coalitions. She's absolutely right. We better start building those political coalitions for immature technologies that are going to be critical to decarbonize. Um, so let me pause there. I know we're uh, running short on time. Let me hand it back to Zoya. And thanks for having me. Thank you. That was great. Uh, I, I want to let you guys respond to what uh, each of you just said, but I think we're going to focus on questions because we've gotten so many great questions from the audience. And I am going to group them into two major groups. So we've gotten a bunch of questions on battery storage. We have one 
from a battery scientist that I'm going to read out loud to you guys and hopefully you can respond to that. So uh, this person wants you to please comment on your vision on the deployment of energy storage in the USA, given that most of the scale up and development has occurred outside of the US, manufacturing and deployment, how does this affect the policy options? And I'll let you guys decide who, who wants to answer that first. I'll, I'll jump in and, and be relatively brief on this. Um, I, I think maybe Varun in particular may be able to speak to this more than I can. Um, I'll just say, you know, in, in the report itself, we, we recommend a sort of dedicated investment tax credit for grid scale electricity storage as, uh, as a tool to enable continued sort of smart deployment of not just solar and wind, but, uh, you know, uh, electricity storage, ben, uh, we think will benefit all technologies, uh, flexible, firm, intermittent and the like. Um, I, I do think um, uh, that uh, an, a sort of under-discussed uh, element in the electricity storage conversation um, is, is a, a conversations are around long duration uh, and seasonal uh, electricity storage, um, which falls very firmly into the bucket of technologies that Varun was just talking about, uh, a bucket of technologies that is not very full right now. We don't have many great options for long duration electricity storage, um, uh, you know, the, of the type that would enable taking a bunch of sort of excess solar generated in the summer and uh, consuming it months later uh, when the sun doesn't shine as much in, in sort of a Northern Western hemisphere country like the United States. Um, and I, I don't, I, I can't speak to the technological feasibility of those options as, as not an engineer. Um, but I, I do think that when we when we look at the declining cost of lithium ion storage systems, uh, often paired with solar at both the grid scale and the residential and commercial scale, um, that we're only telling part of the story, uh, that we're talking about uh, storage that is economic over a matter of hours or days. Um, but as, uh, as solar and wind continue to deploy, we're going to be sort of over generating um, in, uh, in the seasons, um, now that we're, we're approaching the sort of multi-hundred gigawatt or terawatt scale capacities of these, of these technologies. And, uh, and, and we need solutions, uh, we need solutions for that challenge. I don't, I don't necessarily want to call it a, a problem or, or a sort of a hard obstacle. Um, Varun also mentioned uh, flexible demand. There's, there's a number of things you could do. Um, but I think in, in the conversation around, uh, like, parallel and impressive progress in lithium ion electricity storage um, that we've seen with batteries uh, as, as at the same time we've seen solar and wind. I think we need to be talking about that problem and it, and it speaks to something that I, uh, that I wanted to mention in reaction to what Leah was saying, which is that, you know, the, I, I think that the progress that we've seen in electric power decarbonization, um, particularly deployment of zero carbon technologies over the last decade has been very impressive. My worry is that it slows down, that that narwhal curve, uh, that we don't uh, either sort of match the progress over the next 10, 10 20, 40 years, um, but that it actually starts to slow as policymakers get a little more wary of the, of the absolute subsidy cost, as, uh, as the sort of value deflation effect that we see in intermittent technologies um, uh, becomes more significant. Um, and as we, as we encounter other technical obstacles to decarbonizing industry, decarbonizing heavy transport, aviation, things like that. Um, so I agree with Leah's point that we sort of, we, we want to uh, continue, sustain, and accelerate the pace at which we have been decarbonizing. Um, uh, I, I don't necessarily think that means relying on the same uh, policy supports for the same technologies in perpetuity. Not to uh, not not to caricature your your argument if I did, Leah, but that's that's that was, that's just sort of my response, both on the storage and then on the general question. Yeah, I'll go really quickly on storage. I, I think storage is today where solar was a decade ago, um, and we are about to witness an explosion in the deployment of lithium-ion storage. Our firm, Renew Power, is building the largest battery in India, in, in the region, frankly. Um, and, and here in the United States, we're even farther accelerated uh, along storage deployment. I'm, I'm very excited by, by what storage can do because it's so versatile. In addition to, to combating value deflation, as Alex brought up, and we should talk about value deflation, um, you know, storage can do all kinds of cool things. You can put it on transmission lines and effectively upgrade the capacity of the transmission line by uh, smoothing the, the load factor of the line. So I, I expect to see a ton of uh, energy storage deployment, but I'd like to see is storage being deployed in the most strategic ways at the transmission level, at the distribution level, on places in the network that uh, will be congested today and in the future, we need to kind of skate to where the puck is. Uh, so we need market mechanisms to, to site storage most effectively. 
the only thing I'll add, which isn't really on storage and it'll be brief is that, yeah, Alex is totally right. And, you know, things don't just slow down because of value deflation and things like that. They also slow down because of politics and opposition. Um, and, you know, utilities have been attacking these laws, whether that's net metering or renewable portfolio standards. And for some reason, Mitch McConnell has zero interest in extending the ITC or the PTC. And so we can't even really get it on the congressional agenda. Um, so if you look actually year by year, about the deployment of wind and solar in the United States, it's really easy to kind of think like, oh, wow, you know, exponential growth, but it's actually not. That's a myth. If you go into the data, it's a very much like a boom bust thing. And partially those busts are tied to the um, tax credits expiring as everybody knows. So, you know, perhaps we're at a moment now where tax credits going away won't cause those busts as much, but, getting to, whether that's for batteries or wind or solar, getting to a real actual sustained exponential growth or you know exponential growth to some point and then linear growth, we are nowhere near that. And it's really a myth that people have um, that we are. Great. Um, okay, let's, let's pivot to politics a bit because we've gotten a lot of questions from folks about that. Um, let's see, I'm gonna combine a bunch of these questions into one giant question, so please forgive me if this is a bit broad, um, but it's worth talking about. So we have a question that broadly asks, how significant will the upcoming presidential election be in determining how quickly we transition to clean energy? Now, within that as well, I'd love to hear maybe first from you, Leah, there have been all these different ideas about how best to bring about like a, a clean energy revolution. Um, there's the Green New Deal, there's a green stimulus, there's a, there's a carbon tax, which we got a couple questions about, which we cannot get into right now because it's just, we'll go down that rabbit hole. But um, what do you think is the best pathway to, to real action, to real policy? Yeah, well, on terms of the first question, I don't think we can overstate the importance of this election. I mean, Four years of Trump was terrible enough. Another four, both for our democratic institutions and for the climate crisis, would just be devastating. And I think probably most people on this call understand that there's no more extra time in the clock, right? Like I live in California. We're already in fire season. It's only June. There are already three named hurricanes in the Atlantic. That normally happens in August. Climate change is happening now. And uh, we are really not on the right course when it comes to having policy in place that changes things. I had a journalist call me up yesterday and say, do you think emissions have peaked because, you know, there's estimates that maybe will decline 8% this year. And I said, no, there's no way. Emissions don't just magically fall. You need government policy in order to lock in emissions declines. We might have a, a temporary decline, but all the journal, all the people who are doing that research say that we will have a rebound. In the financial crisis, emissions fell 1% and then rebounded the next year five percentage points. Okay, five percentage points. So I mean, even if we have an 8% decline, locking that in, that requires government policy. What kind of government policy? My own view, which is in line with this report, is a clean electricity standard is the number one thing that we need. Because if we can decarbonize the electricity system, that will enable us to decarbonize um, buildings and transportation. And that gives us 50% of the problem right there. Uh, you know, as Varun was saying, there are other industries that do require innovation and that are much harder. That's heavy industry, for example, agriculture. We also just have to get completely rid of oil and gas. So that one's got to go to zero. Um, so, you know, it's not a simple problem, but from my perspective, we get that piece right. We start getting um, building standards right. We start getting electrification and vehicles going up at an exponential rate. Then we are on beginning to be on the right path. So those are some of the policies that I'm really focused on. Great. Alex, do you want to respond to that as well? Certainly. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk about, you know, politics in the election. I, I do want to sort of draw attention um, to, I, I think, uh, an interesting point of debate, maybe between myself and Leah or, or within this whole conversation, um, which is that uh, solar and wind are like 70, 90 percent cheaper than they were uh, 15 years ago. Right. Um, they're just they just are. You know, you're, we're talking about a dollar per watt for solar in, in the U.S. in a lot of cases cheaper than that. It sounds like in, in places like India and Australia. Um, 
uh, but we're also, as you point out, Leah, still seeing these boom and bust cycles. So we, I think we have to ask ourselves sort of what does cheap mean um, if uh, if we're hearing that, you know, these projects are subsidy independent um, and the absolute prices for these for panels and for turbines is lower than it's ever been. But you still see a complete drop off in the deployment um, when uh, when the subsidy goes away. Have we actually made sort of truly cheap competitive technologies, technological sectors. Um, I think to some extent you have, but I, I, I do, uh, and, and I agree that there uh, has been, have been efforts um, by bad actors um, to fight the, both the innovation and the deployment in clean energy technologies. Um, but I also think that, uh, that since both of those things are true, that uh, solar is cheaper than it's ever been, but, uh, but we, we still talk about needing further subsidization. Um, I think that speaks to the, the need for uh, both a sort of wider set um, of technologies and, and still significant uh, innovation um, in, in making uh, and continuing to make uh, solar and wind cheap. And, I, and, I, I, uh, and maybe in particular solar, and this is something Varun has talked a lot about, um, you know, one of the worries with something like the, with the ITC for solar is that it incentivizes further deployment of, uh, of polysilicon panels, maybe to the detriment of advanced technologies that could be even cheaper, perovskites, organic solar, um, th things like that. Um, uh, so, you know, I, not, not to say that those, those technologies are going to come down from heaven and save us, um, but I do think that speaks to a, an interesting tension here. Um, uh, you know, the deployment policies have been successful at driving cost decline, solar and wind are cheaper than ever. Um, but how much does that really get us if, uh, if we continue to have to use sort of brute force deployment and standards to, uh, to guarantee decarbonization? Um, you know, I think there will be a good amount of that, but um, even as the United States and China and Germany have bought down the cost of solar um, over the last 10, 20 years, um, uh, you know, most countries around the world, I think, um, are, are not going to uh, deploy, to de deploy the, the kinds of policies that would be needed to sort of force or, or standardize 100% decarbonization. Um, so that's the sort of tension that we wanted to get at, like how, like how competitive and, and how mature are these technologies on the metric of total deep decarbonization across industries? Yeah, uh, I'll very quickly say um, to your original question, Zoya, I agree with Leah, we cannot overstate the importance of this election. Um, we may disagree on what the top, top, tippy top priority policies are. For me, they are get a carbon tax passed and uh, achieve a tripling of clean energy research, development, and demonstration funding over the next five years. I think those are the two things that we can get done. We've got bipartisan support for, uh, and if we push hard, uh, they'll do the bulk of the work. I also think that sector-specific standards and investments, like Leah brought up, are, are very important policies. Uh, and then finally, I'll say, we are in an interesting political moment right now. COVID is happening. There's the opportunity for a green recovery. And I think we should follow the example of some of the other countries we've seen, Germany, for example which combines short-term measures with a long-term industrial strategy to kind of own the industries of the future. In Germany's case, for example, hydrogen uh, and electric vehicles. We've got a chance to do that too. We should not let the short-term uh, jobs agenda co-opt the long-term transformative climate and industrial agenda that the United States has a chance of doing a really good job on in this political moment. Real, real quick, Zoya, um, I, I wanted to echo but what Varun and Leah were both saying about this moment. Uh, you know, uh, right as the pandemic started um, a, a couple months ago, we started to release a series of other policy papers uh, making the case for, at this point, over $500 billion in potential federal spending on recovery, on infrastructure, on R&D, in and outside of energy technologies. Um, and we thought, you know, two months ago that there, there might be quite a bit of appetite for that type of spending this year. I'm sort of less certain about that. Um, and I have, I'm not, uh, I, after 2016, I stopped even trying to predict uh, anything more than five minutes in the future. Um, but uh, I, I think there is a potential window, whether it's this year or next year, um, as, we, uh, as we need to confront a, a really sort of once in a century economic crisis um, to double down on American innovation on American industries. Um, and, and that's a conversation that we want to be a part of. Yeah, and I just want to add that I don't know where Alex got his numbers from about all this decline in wind and solar, because I was watching Michael Moore's film and I heard that wind and solar are not cheap. So then again, oh, his God. stats might be 10 to 15 years out of date anyway. <laughs> uh, if that went over anyone's head, you can go to grist.org and type in Michael Moore and read up on, on a very problematic 
Documentary. Um, okay, here's another question, and we're gonna we're gonna keep powering through. So so um, I think we're gonna wrap up the the questions soon, maybe with this one. But if you do have more questions, just drop them in. We'll see what we can get to. Um, okay, so this is a great question. In 2008, Rahm Emanuel famously said, "Never let a good crisis go to waste." What kinds of unique opportunities does the COVID crisis present in terms of accelerating clean energy? whether politically, financially, or otherwise. And I would also just note that uh, COVID isn't the only crisis happening right now. There's a crisis of police brutality, um, and a lot of people are taking to the streets, as everyone here knows. And there's a connection there that Leah pointed out um, when, this, um, when this webinar was, was rescheduled, that there's a connection between environmental justice, climate change, all of these things are tied together. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak to that as well a bit in your response, Leah, um, to this question about how we can use the current crisis to accelerate action. Yeah. So I've been a little depressed for the last few days because I feel like uh, the environment, the environmental movement, climate movement and energy, you know, people are, are letting this crisis go to waste. Not because we're not trying. I'm not criticizing us, but we are losing. We are not on the agenda in Congress. I don't even know how much we're on the agenda. If we've got a new administration in 2021, that just brings me deep sadness and makes me very disturbed. Um, so I want to say that what does this crisis do? So first of all, I do believe deeply that climate is an issue of justice, including racial justice. There was a wonderful article um, between uh, Reverend, Reverend Lockwood and um, Bill McKibben, where he talked about how 68% uh, of Black Americans live within 30 miles of a coal plant. And so these issues are about equity, and they're about making sure that Black, Brown, and Indigenous people can breathe in this country, literally. That's not even a metaphor. So I think that we should be talking about the justice that is at the center of what we're trying to do, because, um, you know, a lot of these concerns that people have are about income inequality, which is all, including along racial lines. And the climate crisis really is a question of income inequality, because the impacts hit poorer people the hardest, including uh, Black and Indigenous people in particular. So I just want to say one thing that kind of responds to what people have been saying, which is we are always on our heels when it comes to the climate, energy, and environmental conversation. We are always saying, oh, we don't have the money. We need to minimize costs. Oh, you know, okay, we just want this little thing. We're just going to like squeeze it into this thing. I think we need to stop thinking in that way and take some inspiration from what's happening right now. Why do we need to think of deployment and innovation as a trade-off? I know why, because we always feel there's scarcity, that there's not enough money for climate. Well, why can't we do both? Why can't we get more money for climate change? Let's start from first principles, which is asking the question of how do we want to spend money as society? And that is exactly what the protesters are trying to get us to do. They're saying, you know, should we be spending six billion dollars every year on the new york city police department or not and if we don't spend money on that what else could we spend on for example public transit funding um you know the new york city subway system which is dramatically underfunded and would of course help climate things so do you really think that the police are focused always on minimizing costs when you look at their budgets and how they have gone up over time you certainly don't come away with the idea that that's how people are thinking about and when we think about costs too, costs are also jobs. Think about the case of California, something I've studied in detail. There's a lot of union-based jobs in the clean energy sector in California, and that has certainly pushed up costs, but it's also locked in the policy in a really powerful way. There's a reason why California kept ratcheting up their renewable energy targets, um, and it's because they had a very strong relationship with labor. So, you know, from my perspective, I'm not as fixated on costs. I'm more fixated on expanding the pie and getting more money for all the things that we have to do. And why is that? Because climate change, in my belief from reading economic papers and living on this planet, climate change will cost us everything. It will cost us the entire economy. And so, you know, why are we always painting ourselves into this corner of saying, oh, we need to spend less money? Maybe we need to spend more. Um, that was really powerful, Leah. Thank you for saying all that. Um, and, and we are in a, in a powerful, important moment. Um, I think it is critical, though, to remember that what we are facing is the largest challenge of humanity. And if we don't focus on cost, we will screw this up. Um, so I, 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 on that one point, I disagree entirely that if we attempt to 
achieve the biggest reinvention of human infrastructure ever attempted, and we throw cost out the window, um, we won't achieve that reinvention. Uh, that, that really worries me. Um, it, in India, I, 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 I felt it. Um, we are extremely cost conscious. Every company is extremely cost conscious. And as a result, sometimes that, that can in fact cramp policy making. But in many other cases, what we came out with were fairly innovative ways to minimize subsidies and maximize deployment. I think we can achieve the same thing in the United States um, to, to you know, rapidly increase, uh, especially because the, the most useful thing the United States can do is demonstrate to the world that you can do a low cost energy transition. If the United States does a high cost energy transition, it doesn't help the world, right? We account for a dwindling share of global emissions and there's no demonstration effect to the rest of the world if what we do is a gold-plated energy transition. Um, so insofar as the United States can develop the technology to be used all over the world, and the United States can do so, you know, do its own energy transition at a very low cost and demonstrate a lot of innovative technologies, a high penetration uh, renewable energy system, uh, we will be most useful. So, but, but the, the vast majority of the statements that Leah just made, I think are spot on, and this is a very powerful moment. So thank you for sharing that. I, I agree with that. Um, and, and just to try and wrap up a bunch of thoughts and into one quick answer and respond to Mark's question uh, about, about a crisis. We are in a crisis. I, I don't know what the response will be. But I think what you see with solar and wind is that sort of technology specific supports for early industries work. We've seen this not just in energy, but we, we've seen it in GPS and in semiconductors. Uh, we've, we've seen it um, in agriculture and in biotech. Um, and I think that uh, that is sort of a key takeaway for me that uh, that climate change remains a largely technological problem. We've seen serious technological progress, but not nearly enough. Um, so like what we've done with solar and wind and lithium ion batteries, uh, we need uh, not identical, but sort of similar support and hopefully significant and robust support for advanced nuclear reactors for long duration storage for carbon removal technologies, both at the plant and direct air capture, for hydrogen infrastructure, for carbon pipelines, for biotech solutions for agricultural yields and for advanced fertilizers, uh, for fake meat and protein alternatives, uh, advanced materials and transportation. Um, uh, you, you know, you, uh, the, the question was about not letting our crisis go to waste. There are a whole slate of really immature but really promising technologies and technological sectors um, that I think that we should be, that we should be thinking a lot more about. Great. I think uh, we should wrap up at this point, but I'd like to open up the floor to sort of uh, let all three of you uh, leave, leave the audience with any last thoughts or any last points that you wanted to note. We should start with Varun. I am always on the hot seat. Um, <laughs> look, I, I, I had a great time. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I, I think uh, Leah's expertise and the research she's done on the importance of politics and how the most efficient solution is rarely the one that's going to be most politically effective uh, is super important for us all to remember and to remember the role of entrenched interests that oppose uh, a clean energy transition. There are rare cases where efficient policies do have bipartisan support. Innovation is one of them and thanks Alex for listing off the litany of technology needs we have. Uh, but in many other cases, we may be in a second best world. I just urge us to pick the second best solution and not the third or fourth or fifth or 10th best solutions. Uh, and thanks so much for having me. This is really exciting. Yeah, I totally agree. This has been a great conversation. Um, and, you know, in terms of costs that, that Varun and I were going back and forth on, I think there's a difference between sort of like firm level costs in terms of trying to be competitive and beat out other uh, companies and, and sort of government spending and how much we should be prioritizing this. And so I'm, I'm speaking on that side of the issue that I think the government should be making more investments in this. And that's why I really support this new emerging consensus, which is about setting standards for where we need to go and setting timelines and targets doing investment from the government that says this is a priority, here's money that goes behind it, and centering justice, making sure that as we are building the new clean energy economy that we're not leaving behind, particularly Black and Indigenous Americans who have been really um, breathing in the dirty pollution of the old energy system that we built. Um, so, so that's the approach that I take, and I'm really excited that there is a new way to think about this. I agree that it might not be the economist's first best solution, but I think it can be a winning 
coalition solution. Um, and if you're interested in that, we have a new paper that we, we just wrote about in the Washington Post today, which looks at do we expand the coalition by linking economic and social justice with climate policy? And overall, we, we do find that. Um, so yeah, it's been a wonderful conversation. And um, you know, regardless of where you come down on these issues, stay in the fight because climate change is going to take all of us. And ultimately, we're all allies <laughs> because we're up against the fossil fuel industry and electric utilities. So we have much bigger uh, people to disagree with. As, as I always do, I'll take another opportunity to say that we need to make clean energy cheap. And I feel like the conversation that we've had today is the right one. We're not talking about sort of pie in the sky models for what the future will look like. And we're, and we're not talking about climate change as a purely sort of regulatory problem or pollution problem like the environmental problems of the 20, 20th century. Uh, we're talking specifically about what types of policies accelerate innovation in a set of specific clean energy technologies that I think will have high leverage on reducing emissions in the long term. Uh, you know, sort of uh, nuclear has been a big uh, uh, focus of, of breakthrough over the last few years. Um, we were significantly more focused on, honestly, solar and wind and batteries before that. And increasingly, uh, we're, we're excited about uh, some carbon remo removal technologies and uh, low carbon and, and uh, emissions reducing technologies in the agricultural sector, which doesn't get nearly enough, uh, nearly enough consideration. Um, and I just want to, I would just end by saying that that is the right conversation, um, that that's the right debate to have, and I'm glad we're having it. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much for tuning in to our 124 folks who stuck around to the bitter end. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks to all three of you for a great conversation. And thanks to Breakthrough for, for hosting this and organizing it. Thank you so much for tuning in to Breakthrough Dialogues. If you like our show, tell your friends, rate us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or on whatever platform you get your podcasts. As we wrap up this fourth season of our show, I want to give extra thanks to our producers, Alyssa Kadaman, Tali Perlman, and Steve Reyes, without whom the show would not come close to existing. We'll be taking a break for a few weeks, but you can continue to follow our work on Twitter at the BTI and of course at www.thebreakthrough.org. Catch you next time.